1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you would tonight, please turn there and uh, let's look together. Got a very, very precious and comforting passage of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. <clears throat> Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. It's an imperative. It's got to happen. It must happen. Why? Because this victory that we're going to see in this chapter is a person. Let's read a little farther down from verse 53. So when this corruptible, verse 54, shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The two words, the two times that the word must is used in verse 53 is because of the person in verse 57. It's reminiscent of what Paul wrote in in, uh, Romans chapter 8. If you'd turn over there with me for a moment. Romans 8, 34. Romans 8, 34. I think we get a sense of the message of this whole passage in our text. If we get our, our minds in the right place here. Romans 8, 34, who is he that condemneth, that is, that condemneth me, or the elect of God, any of God's elect, verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect, who is he that condemneth, it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. In other words, Paul is saying, we're innocent uncondemnable before God because of a person, because it is him. Why do we stand before God in perfect righteousness? Three things in that verse 34. Christ died. He washed all of my sin away with his precious blood. His, he robed me in the eternal white of his own righteousness. A robe washed in his blood, paid all of my sin debt so that there's no sin on my account. That's why nobody can condemn me. Justified before God. He rose again. What happened on Calvary is accept, accepted of God, successful, satisfactory, and sufficient. Or Christ Jesus cannot rise. We know that we are indeed redeemed by him and made spotless to stand in his presence, in the presence of God, because he is the firstborn of the dead, because he rose for us, died in our place, rose again. And listen to Romans 4.25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. He is why we're justified before God. And then the third thing that verse 34 there says is he also, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us as our mediator is God's son who gave himself for us. We can never lose a case in the courts of heaven. No one can lay anything to our charge because Christ Jesus, our redeemer, is also our advocate. Our case is based not on anything about us. He doesn't plead anything we've done 
or would promise to do. But our case is based on his precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So Christ himself is our justification. He is why we stand guiltless in the sight of God. So what does that have to do with our text? Well, the imperative in verse 53 also has for its reason the Lord Jesus Christ himself, a person, and what he is to us, as we saw in verse 57. The victory is given to us, and those musts, the, the must, this corruptible must put on incorruption, that's the victory. From death to life, from, from impurity to holiness, to from our sin to his righteousness. Those musts are a victory won by the Son of God. The certainty of us going from, and this, these are the, the these are, are the, the Greek definition of the words in the text. We're quoting it a little different way, but because these are the definitions. The certainty of us going from impure and perishable to perfect and everlasting in our very being. That's what we're, we are. We're, we're going from what we are now to what we are in him. That certainty, that victory was won by the Lord Jesus Christ for us and given to us by him. The way that God has won this victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son defeating every enemy, including our own sinful nature. We are our own worst enemy by nature, but the old man is, is done for. So, so him, the old us, Satan and all of, all of those who work for him, this whole world, this whole wretched, godless world, it's a victory one. And that's important to understand. All of the blessings that we have are standing before God in righteousness and holiness without blemish and without spot is a victory that was won. You see why we're so insistent to proclaim from God's word that whatever Christ came to do and gave himself on Calvary to do he fully accomplished? If that victory is not won, then we're goners. We have no hope. We are condemnable before God. We, are, we will die in our sins. And we will never be anything <clears throat> but dying, dead and dying. We, 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 we insist repeatedly in, in the gospel messages that he did not make victory available. He won it. That's, that's what we have to understand here. What happened on the cross is not subject to our pathetic, depraved, sinful will. It was a victory won for us. Our will is the problem, and Christ crucified is the victory. And there is certainty because of who did it, who accomplished it. So that's what, what, what we're seeing there in verse 53. A person. Like in Romans 8 and all through the, the gospel is a person. <laughs> he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Martha, I am the resurrection. Don't trust in events. Don't trust in doctrine. Like the Pharisees did. You think by searching the scriptures and knowing the scriptures you have life, but they, they point to me. And you won't come to me that you might have life. So that's uh, that, that's what begins to jump out in this passage. If we if we begin with the very first verse there, verse 53, this corruption must put on incorruption. Why? Why is that a necessity? Well, because of who it is that 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 won that victory for us. It's that, that event, us. Becoming immortal, 
holy, changed creatures before God with his own glorious body, made like unto his own glorious body. That's, that's the victory here. And it was given to us by the Savior. Look at verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You see that? That, that event, that miracle, that wonderful, like an old dried up dead seed that's planted in the ground. And because God gives it life, because for, as we read, God giveth it a body as it pleaseth him. And then we go from that shriveled up, corruptible thing, dead, no, no life, no hope. A seed will just lay there. You lay it right here and it'll just lay there forever. It'll never be anything. But when the Lord Jesus Christ died for us, we died in him. A corn of wheat, except it fall into the ground and die, it'll, it abideth alone. But if it fall into the ground and die, it beareth much fruit. And we, Paul has described this event that way, that we're, we're, we're dead, but we're planted in Christ. We're, we're immersed in Christ. We're baptized into Christ. And rise again with newness of life as pictured in baptism. And we, we come forth with a different body, not the same. We're changed, glorious and, and perfect and fit to, to live face to face with the Son of God forever. That's the victory. And it's the bringing to pass of God's word. Death is swallowed up in victory, simple language, simple truth. The last enemy shall have been destroyed. Death is swallowed up in victory. Again, we have the word victory. In this verse, people talk about the afterlife as though it's just something that's there, you know. The same way they think about the universe. It's just there, it's, you know, we just, here we are. And uh, the earth is just here and the sky is just up there. The after, there's this thing called the afterlife, you know, and it just happens to be there. No, what happens to every man and woman, boy and girl that dies is a direct result of what Christ did on Calvary, good or bad. It's when it comes to your eternal destiny. It's not just there. It's a question of the victory that Christ won. Death is swallowed up in victory, or it's not. What happens to this body when it dies is attributable alone to the Son of God. And what he did on this earth. If there is victory over death for you, it was won by your Savior. What a simple truth this is and how thoroughly it banishes all thought of what we do and what, you know, what we make of ourselves and how, how, how we live or don't live. The preaching of the gospel of Christ and what he did is the savor of death and life. Because Christ crucified is the cause of life in them that believe. And to reject him is to forfeit what he did and to be consigned to everlasting death. So it all is consequential of Christ and what he did in this world. Him. He that hath the Son hath life. That's what happens. That's what the afterlife is. He who hath the Son hath life. And he who hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's true right now, and that's true in eternity. That's the simple gospel that we preach. Victory, salvation, justification, our standing before God, life from the dead, uh, from a dead seed to a glorious 
fruit-bearing plant unto God, the difference is a person. That's what's so clearly, clearly laid out here. All of this also from this verse 54. Let's say this. All of this is just another dot on God's timeline. It comes to pass like everything else. And I'm not saying that to trivialize it, but to show simply how that it's according to the perfect will and declaration of God in his word. Because God said so. Because God said that death shall be swallowed up in victory for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the message of this verse. It's because God said so. It's his perfect will expressed, revealed in the scripture coming to pass. Just another dot on the timeline. And yet, what a dot. (laughs) What a dot. What a wonderful thing shall come to pass when this body breathes its last. Christ gives victory over death. God said so. Job said in Job 19, 23, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. How is Job able to say that? How can he know that? To the point where some say when he's talking about engraving it into the rock forever, he's saying, put this on my tombstone. My Redeemer lives. And because he lives, I will live forever. I'll see him. In, in my flesh, changed, yes, but me. He's redeemed me soul, body, and spirit. I will yet see him. After this body is corroded and, 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 de- and decayed and is nothing but dust if it comes to that, I'm going to stand and see God in my flesh. That's the victory that, that our text is talking about. And Job could say that way back then. <laughs> Some say that's the oldest scripture in the Bible, even older than Genesis, the book of Job. He was able to say that then. Why? Because God said it. That's what our text is telling us. Because God said so. The saying of God shall come to pass. Our enemies cannot win. You see that? They can't win. Death is swallowed up in victory. The last death is called an enemy. We have others and none of them can win over us. They can't have the victory. Where is the victory for them? It can't be. The word grave is also there. And I didn't read far enough, did I? But the word grave in our text Verse, verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Where Our enemies can't win because of who our champion is. That's the message of the whole passage. The word grave there also is the word for hell. There's no victory for hell or death or the grave. And because... Um, the, the, there's no victory for the grave. Death is not so such a bad thing. There's no sting to it for the believer, for the sheep of God. The way that death is vanquished is by life. And Christ is the life. That's what mortal putting on immortality means. Life, eternal life, everlasting life. Christ our life. Because my Redeemer liveth, Job said, I shall also live, even after worms have destroyed this body. And we know that eternal life is not just living forever. It's living in His presence. To go and be with Him is far better. 
not just living forever. I don't want to be like this forever to you. Who shall save me from the body of this death? Look at verse 56. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. Death is a problem because of sin. And sin is a problem because of God's holy law, which is just an expression of his person. Who he is, is is what he requires, the righteousness that he requires. The wages of sin is death and sin is transgression of God's law. Which our Savior said, by the way, that the law is contained in these two. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. In those two things, all of the law are contained. Our problem, though, is that we hate God by nature. You see how that brings that out? People put the the Ten Commandments on their wall. They're like, well, I haven't killed anybody today. Really? According to God, you reckon you have? When he said that if you get angry at your brother for no reason, you've murdered him in your heart. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that aside for now, though. They put him on the wall. They say, well, here, here's what we have to abide by in order to have favor with God. No. Do you love God with all your heart? You know how that happens? You meet his son and fall in love with his son. God gives you faith in His Son. The law is contained in that, in loving Him and loving His people. Loving your neighbor. And the reason, you know, we hate God, you know why we hate God, is because we love ourselves. (laughs) This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and, and we hated the light because we loved our darkness. We love the darkness rather than God's light. And the world sings, you know, the greatest love there is, is to love yourself. That's what sin is. That's our problem, is that we love ourselves and not God. Paul said, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, Let him be accursed. That's your problem. Your problem is not that your great, 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 great grandfather ate the wrong fruit. Your problem is he hated God and so do you. And I do too by nature. But by his grace, we've been given eyes to see him that he's altogether lovely, and we've fallen in love with God's Son. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And by his grace we do. Not in a way that measures up, not in a way that can be called our righteousness before him. Christ is all of our righteousness before him. It's not Christ plus we love God. Our love is bad enough to put us in hell without Christ. But by his grace, we can say with Simon, I love you, Lord. You know everything. And you know, he's the one that put, we love him because he first loved us. His love is the cause of ours. So the law, that's our problem, is that we hate God. But think about it this way. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Well, do we, do we love God? Well, God came down here. Maybe there's some evidence of how we felt about him. What what happened when he came down here to earth among us? Well, we ridiculed him. We The only reason we ever even asked him. Would you like to ask God a question? The only reason we asked him any questions was to trip him up and to prove him to be an imposter so we could go on loving ourselves. We had no room for him. We stoned him, tried to. We despised it. We opposed him at every turn. The only ones that didn't were the ones that he walked up to and said, come, I'll make you something that you're not now. 
Those are the only ones that didn't hate him. They didn't choose him. He chose them. And so we showed how we feel about God. We spit on him, cursed his name, humiliated him in every possible way we could, up to and including the most ignominious death that we could possibly imagine for him. We nailed him to a cross and we mocked him while he bled. That's our problem. We nailed the Son of God to a cross and we delighted in the fact that he died before us in shame. But by that very cross, the Lord Jesus Christ took the punishment of his people, satisfied that law which sealed our doom. And it's by the preaching of that cross that we're made to fall in love with him. <laughs> the preaching of our hatred for him and his love for us. that we're caused to fall in love with him and his son. And there's only one thing to say to that. Verse 57. Thanks. <laughs> we are bound to give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. We're bound. We owe it to him. We're compelled we're debtors to say, thank you, God, because salvation's of the Lord. You know, the word thanks there, thanks be to God, that word thanks is translated 11 times in Scripture, thanks. But do you know, can you guess what it's translated as 160 times? Grace. Grace be to God. The victory that Christ won for us on Calvary is given unto us by grace. And that's what we say to him, Lord, grace be to you. The way in all eternity we'll say salvation and glory and honor unto the strength Power unto the Lamb, unto the Lamb. So now, even now, we say, Lord, grace unto you. Grace be unto you. This thanksgiving that we express is an acknowledgement of that free and sovereign grace of God, whereby we are included put in Christ who has made unto us all we need. And notice there in that verse 57, it's not offered unto us. It is given unto us. Thank God for that. Thank God for every word of this glorious passage of scripture. It is given. It is given to those who have done nothing but that which would make us undeserving of it. It is given unto us. That's what grace is. Turn with me to Matthew 13, please. We'll close with this thought. Matthew 13, 10. With this thought in mind, it is given. The victory is given to us. Matthew 13, 10, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given.
when he gives us the knowledge of himself, the mystery of his person and work and his grace, God's sovereign love for us in Christ Jesus, when it's given to us, that's when life begins for this dead sinner. Because it is given. For whosoever hath, verse 12, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted. And I'd heal them, but blessed are your eyes. <laughs> oh, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear blessed of God blessed are the pure in heart you weren't born like that we're bound to give thanks to God for that thank you God thanks be to God grace be to God almighty for the victory won by his son and given to us. You know who knows what grace is? You can't learn it in a book. Well, it can be revealed to you in scripture now, but I'm talking about you can look up books and read doctrinal essays on the, the doctrine of grace or the doctrines of grace. You know who knows who, what grace is? A sheep. <laughs> a sheep that has been lost and knows that the only reason that it's at home now is because the shepherd came a-seeking. Because he went where we were, found us where we were, picked us up, put us on his shoulder, and brought us home rejoicing. If that's you, you know what grace is. And you're not going to know it any other way except by knowing him, to know him. All of it's a person, all of it's Christ. I found my sheep, which was lost, my sheep. And so Paul says here, all grace and glory unto God for sending his only begotten son to bring me home by the sacrifice of himself. We know what it took for him to bring that sheep back home. We know why he's able to call us my sheep. Because he bought us with his precious blood. Gave himself for our wretched souls. I pray he'll give us grace to go from here praising him for it. Let's pray.